shortly after that. Um, first of all, I want to say thank Abby Hornstein for, for having me here. Please, you know, you know you come in. And the feral cat should come in too, because that actually it inspires me. Um, thank you very much for organizing this and arranging this and having me here. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Amitai, for um, both for connecting me to Aviv and also uh, for giving me sort of like my initial um, opportunity in the uh, comics world in the recent past because uh, I hadn't done comics for years and then it was Amitai's um, anti-Semitic cartoon contest uh, like maybe three or four years ago. 2006. 2006, huh? wow, we're getting old. Uh, that got me back in the game, essentially, uh, when I drew a comic for his uh, reaction to the Iranian anti-Semitic cartoon contest. Mine didn't win because apparently it was too offensive for the judges. But, but it was my favorite. That's all that matters to me. Um, and I also want to say, some people said I shouldn't be doing this material in Israel, um, that you know you cannot do it here. And uh, I actually find I'm really proud and happy to be doing it in Israel. And it's actually, it's really interesting to me to sort of share this stuff with you. Um, but they said I shouldn't do it here. And, and you know, not because it's too incendiary or um, too controversial, because obviously you have a very vibrant debate in this country, um, but because it's too Jewish, you know? And Israelis might not understand the Jewish content of the stuff that I do. Um, but I refuse to believe, I, I actually have faith in you, and I refuse to believe that um, Israel has so pulled itself apart from the Jewish people that you're going to be unable to understand the very basics of Jewish culture. And so, I, I'm with you, and, um, but if you have any questions, first of all, if my English is too quick, let me know and I'll try and slow down a bit. I'll try. Can you understand so far? Yeah. All right, that's good. Does anyone here speak Hebrew even? <laughs> Are you all Americans here? <laughs> And, um, you know, if there's anything you need, like, you know, you, you, if you want to shout out or anything, you have any questions, you let me know. And I'm, I'm here to cater to you. Okay. In the beginning, in the year 70 of the Common Era, the Romans destroyed the Jerusalem Temple, sending the Jews into diaspora. In the year 1952 of the Common Era, Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder created that. Everything that happened between those two days, utterly insignificant. <laughs> this evening, I'm going to take you on a tour through MAD, comics, Jewish comics, sermons for the 70s, sex toys, and self-hatred. My name is Ellie, as we've established, and I draw comics. But I didn't always draw comics. In fact, when I was little, I was a comics reader. And I wasn't just a comics reader, I was a comics reader who was the son of a rabbi, which is a kind of a, a fraught combination, actually. But I was, I was sort of obsessed with the sense of escape that comics provided me. For instance, when I was little, I used to have these fantasies while my father was giving the sermon during, during the uh, Shabbat services. My sister and I were trapped in the, in the first or second row. If we negotiated with my father, we'd be able to sit in the third row. Wait, essentially, wait, your sister? Yeah, I have a sister. You mean it's on the phone? Uh, well, it's conservative. Yeah. Girls can sit. In the yeah, front. girls can sit. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, my sister and I were were sort of trapped in in the first or second rows, and one time my sister went to the bathroom during a sermon, and my father called out from the bima, from the pulpit, "Where are you going?" Because it was the ultimate sign of disrespect and shame for the rabbi's own kids to leave during his sermon. The idea was, if he couldn't keep his own family captive, what good was he? So I was sitting there trapped, you know, and I, I'd retreat in this fantasy, and that's actually where my initial creative rushes began. And my mind would be racing. I'd be staring at the Chumash, the Hebrew-English Bible. You know, Bible? You know, okay. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I'd be staring at the blue ribbon coming down the middle, and I would be fetishizing it. And I'd start fantasizing at these super friends who were on one side of the ribbon. Even Aquaman swimming across from the left. By the way, it took me like 20 hours in Photoshop. You know, I appreciate it. A little respect, a little respect. And on the other side, it would be the super villains. They'd be having this, this battle royale on top of the Bible, all while my father was sermonizing about the imminent destruction of Israel, or ways that we could extend our lives through vitamins. I think all these things uh, came together years later, the terrifying sermons in my ears, not being able to pee, and envisioning these superheroes fighting a duel to the death on a Bible in a sermon I did decades later, essentially, called The Incredible Hulk. The Hulk is basically your average Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde treatment applied to a liberal Jew who becomes 
right-wing batshit insane on the solitary issue of Israel. It's actually based on personal experience. I'm liberal, but when Israel's at war, which, you know, kind of happens often, I find myself becoming tribal or conservative. It was literally born of my masochistic habit when Israel's at war of compulsively consuming turkey sandwiches while watching Fox News. So like the tryptophan from the turkey would be in my bloodstream and the you know, right-wing hysteria from the TV would be coming in my ears and it would turn me into this jingoistic madman running around my apartment furious for Israel. And then afterwards I go back to Fox News and they'd be you know, covering their usual stuff like Obama's birth certificate and I feel so disgusting I have to take a shower. But I think that's one psychological cycle of a certain segment of American jury. Anyway, the Hulk, so the Hulk is basically me. Um, the way I want to do these comics today though I can see you're a very interactive crowd here. So uh, I'm going to you know, hope that uh, someone here will volunteer, for instance, to play the part of Bruce Banner in the Hulk. Do I have a volunteer? Do you like I'm sorry? The dog. The dog, that's right. Would anybody like to play the role? I'll, I'll do the narration, and then you can uh, do the words. Yes? No? Thank you. Yes, really? Oh, thank you. All right. You'll be Bruce Banner of the Hulk. Is that good? Yeah? All right, cool. So without further ado, The Incredible Hulk. The tragic tale of a liberal, socially conscious Jew who turns into a raging mass of psychopathology. Bruce Banner, a politically progressive Jew, settles in to watch some TV. I have a couple of hours before the moon will meet up. Just enough time to watch a special on universal health coverage. But first, some news on PBS. Indigenous Guatemalan mug, free trade coffee, and peace Cheney, hemp jeans. They're all the insignia of progressive American Jewish or non-Jewish uh, citizenry. Without warning, the newscaster makes a remark that could possibly be construed as mildly critical of Israel. And the farmers could not reach their olive groves. No! <laughs> My head throbbing! Not now! Bruce changes into a brutal, bestial mockery of a human, a creature which despises reason, living in fear and rage. Hulk, destroy television, anti-Semite! Hulk, <laughs> launch email campaign to cut funding for PBS! Hulk, start Facebook group called Palestinians already have a saint, Jordan! <laughs> Hulk, listen to raving radio and not feel dirty! Israel's wars are America's wars, it's in the Gospels. Evangelical Christians, only friends, Hulk has. Jesus advocating expelling the Arabs and giving tax cuts to billionaires. Hulk, fight against abortions. Hulk, support creationism. Hulk, deport homosexuals and Mexicans. Hulk, put Jesus Christ on dollar bills. Then, just as quickly as it began, the monster transforms back to human form. It, it feels as though a veil has lifted. I can think again. Good. Bruce Banner spends his days pining for a time when the madness will end. Maybe I can still make that move on Utah. And he can return to a normal life without the beast that was always with him. Here are a couple frames actually from the original Hulk from uh, 1962 by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. I actually use phrases, I'm really like sort of a uh, obsessive compulsive completist with this stuff. I use phrases from the original, so there it says, it feels as though a veil has, li has lifted, I can think again. But I, here, actually, um, brutal, bestial mockery of a human. Uh, but I actually took out worship's power because I thought that was too cliché of an attack on Israel. So, you know, I just want you to know, despite some of the criticism, I actually do exercise restraint. Anyway, Hulk was taking an American Jew and turning him into a paranoid, psychopathological, post-Holocaust, Israel-obsessed Jew. And I feel this is part of a distinct American Jewish heritage of not only inventing cultural icons, but inverting them. And it all goes back to Mad, the Mad comics of the 1950s. I actually take great cultural pride in Mad because it was created by New Yorkers, mostly Jewish New Yorkers, on Lafayette Street in New York City. New Yorkers in New York City. Uh, for instance, Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elger, chief among them. And they brought this cacophonous Yiddish theater sensibility to bear on 1950s American culture. I discovered Mad, actually. You can sit here if you want. All right. uh, I discovered Matt through these reprint editions years later, decades later actually, when it had already become a magazine. And I didn't understand any of the cultural references they were referring to, but I knew that something revolutionary was going on, that it was putting this 
funhouse mirror up to the sacred icons of American culture. For instance, Mickey Mouse, you know, Mickey, with Mickey Mouse, everything is happy. Their version was Mickey Rodent, which presented this totalitarian universe in which all the characters had to wear these first slugging or three-fingered gloves or else face expulsion to detention centers. Here's Mickey spazzing out on Donald and the three little nudnik ducks. To me, to show the true colors of a disnified, commodified culture in uh, 1950s America. Or Archie, America's typical teenager. They turned it, by the way, do you know Archie here? Are you familiar with this stuff? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Mickey Mouse, you know that, right? <laughs> All right. So Archie was this, like, literally America's typical teenager. It was a teenage comic uh, showing the exploits of a teenager in America in the 1950s, until today, actually. I think he became a born-again Christian along the way, but whatever, that was inevitable. Anyway, our, Matt turned him into Starchy, the violent drug addict. Here's Mr. Weatherby, the principal in the high school, who, who they turned into an alcoholic pervert. Or Betty, one of the female stars. Look, look what's coming out of her purse here. A uh, heroin needle, uh, pills, joints, three aces of hearts, meaning trick cards. And that's the 1950s, you know. It's, it wasn't you know, normal to do that kind of thing. And so to me, this is like Jewish outsider humor before uh, Jews became part of the dominant American culture. Eventually, of course, Congress stepped in, ostensibly concerned about juvenile delinquency, and they sort of established the Comics Code in 1954. Mad comics survived only by turning themselves into a magazine. And it was really the horror and violent comics that also existed at the time that sunk the industry. But I like to think that it was these guys, Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elger with Mad, with a revolutionary satirical fervor that they pioneered, attacking conformity in 1950s America that caused the anti-communist crusade. So, now that history is over, a few years ago I was thinking, if Mad is Jewish sensibility holding a funhouse mirror up to American culture, for instance, here's Howdy Doody, uh, which is a you know, famous uh, mannequin dummy uh, from that era. They turn it to Howdy Do It, this mercenary who forces children to make their parents buy them products. Why is nobody putting a funhouse mirror up to Jewish culture today? This is Abe Foxman, the head of the Anti-Defamation League in America. Uh, the, the Jewish community's own Howdy Doody, essentially. And he came out for a certain period in favor of Avigdor Lieberman's loyalty oaths in Israel, which was astonishing from the American Jewish perspective. My version was Abe Foxworthy, who tells President Obama that Americans should have to take loyalty oaths to the Confederate States as well. And to me, it feels like a perfect match because there's so much to satirize. And it brings it full circle, using the mad aesthetic not to lampoon sacred Americana, but the sacred truths, or assumptions really, of Jewish life. But this gets to a question I get asked a lot, you know, why are you drawing these comics? Why are you wasting your life? Uh, you know, just do some yoga, leave the ghetto already, you know? Um, draw out draw, draw cultural stuff, draw about the Kardashians essentially, and you'll make some money. I wish I could, let me explain why I can't. These are normal American children at the age of five. This was me. This was my sister. <laughs> and my parents got divorced around the time these photos were taken. You can see me on the lower left there looking down, already caving into my imaginary world. Uh, by the way, I don't know who these people are, but it looks like something out of a 1970s Italian horror flick. But it's not. It's just American Jewish children who are fighting for Soviet Jewish right, rights because they, their parents asked them to. And they love it. They're having a good time. Anyway, this is how I grew up. My father's religious, but he lived 100 miles away from us. Here he is posing with the cast of Sopranos. <laughs> And when we visit him, my sister and I would be observant. And we'd play the role of the upright, uptight children of rabbis, being molested by Disney characters. <laughs> and then when I was three, they gave away our dog. I'm kidding, it's a Google image search, actually, if, for those who are curious. Um, but you know, the idea of you know, the self-obsession, which is gonna happen a lot here, I just wanted to take a little poke at that. Here we are, children of a rabbi playing doctor. And I know it looks creepy and perverse, but the fact that I'm wearing a yarmulke proves that it's totally wholesome and legit. <laughs> and then we go back to my mom's. But my father was being sort of a panic to legislate the religion from afar. Which isn't easy if you're a rabbi, especially if the crux of so many of your sermons is the fight against assimilation and intermarriage. And he wasn't speaking in a vacuum. Here's Look Magazine from 1964 talking about how by the year 2000, the American Jewish community would comprise a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of American life, 
as opposed to the tiny, tiny minority they were then. Every Halloween, for instance, my father would promise me all the candy in the world if I would just refrain from trick-or-treating because Halloween was a pagan holiday with echoes of pogroms. But the candy never came in the mail, of course, so years later I would overcompensate with the trick-or-treating. <laughs> Okie dokie. Uh, so I'd see my dad every three weeks, and I'd have this intensively Jewish communal experience. And then I'd go back to America at my mom's, but my dad would still be there, just a phone call away, urging me to avoid assimilation at all costs. It might make you wonder what would happen, for instance, if Batman and Robin worked in the American Jewish community. So this comic, actually, Batman and Robin, was um, another one of my sort of experiments in making superheroes Jewish. In the past decade or two decades, there have been a lot of books, academic articles, etc., about how superheroes are Jewish, really, because they were created by Jews, and therefore they, they sort of embody the immigrant experience in America, and things like that. Um, I never really saw my own my own narrative reflected in these stories, actually. And so one of the reasons that I do these kinds of comics is to sort of make a place for the Jewish narrative as I know them and as, and as I experienced them growing up. So without further ado, I would like to ask for volunteers to play Batman and Robin. And I know you guys are a really active crowd here, so. I want to be Batman. All right, here we go. Startup Nation. Where's Robin? Do I have to speak English? <laughs> um, it would help because the cartoon's in English. Yeah, you had to read uh, from the screen. Have you been? You were here for the Hulk, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just me. But I can be Robin. Okay. Um, I'll play the boy because it's pretty. It's pretty much autobiographical. Um, how about Aquaman? At the end, there's an Aquaman. Just one, one. There we go, Aquaman. All right. Here we go. In the Batcave. Batman. There's an emergency at ele elementary school cafeteria. Does that not be Robin? Soon. Batman and Robin. Johnny Goldberg, do not sit down. Just in the nick of time, Batman. <laughs> What's wrong? Is there a bomb? Worse, Johnny. Are you aware that American Jews are on the verge of vanishing completely? Holy ethnic dissolution, Batman. <laughs> huh? If you sit with these Gentiles, you'll be taking the first steps toward destroying the Jewish people. Do you want Hitler to win, Johnny? <laughs> uh, gosh, no, but it's, it's just lunch. According to these reports, early social networks are the clearest indicators of future life choices, including spousal partners. Uh, <clears throat> you, think with, you sit with Gentiles uh, today, tomorrow you'll have sex with them. Then, what, Johnny? Your kids will be bastards. Bastards! <laughs> <laughs> Easy, Robin. Give Johnny a chance to realize what's at stake. Sit with the Jews, Johnny. <laughs> but but I'm not really friends with them. Don't be selfish, Johnny. If you intermarry, you'll be lost to the Jewish people forever. Not just you, but all the unborn generations that would otherwise have sprung from your loins. Do you want that burden, Johnny? Here, take this. What's this? It's a transgressive Jewish watch, Johnny. <laughs> Focus groups show that transgressive Jewish watches instill a genuine ethnic pride, increasing the likelihood you will produce with other Jews. Our work here is done, Robin. Hey, it's Aquaman. What are you doing here? I just finished building the world's first underwater holocaust memorial. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent work, Aquaman. Now, all the Purposes of the world shall know the tragedy that befell the Jews. Next issue, Batman and Robin campaign for Israel on campus. <laughs> so, Batman was pulled straight from my childhood. My sister, God bless her, does not understand any of my comics because she's, like, she's a little bit more assimilated than I am, I guess. Um, but when I did this one, she was like, oh my God, that was us. That was our childhood. I can see, I can see our lives in this comic. And it's, it's kind of true. And it, it kind of came to a head when I went to high school. By the way, we're going to do my entire life story today. Right now we're in the high school years. So I hope you have until like 6 a.m. <laughs> so I decided to go to public school with high school. I'd gone to Hebrew day school through eighth grade. Then I, then I transferred to public school. And it caused a cataclysm between my father and me. Because he wanted me to take a bus into Philadelphia to go to the Jewish day school that existed there. I held my ground where there was a lot of tension, of course. There, there, there had to be if my name was Eliezer. 
And I actually loved high school because it was my first taste of diversity and therefore my first taste of real America. But the fear was what my father would think. He'd want to know who my friends were, whether they were Jewish. In my yearbook, for instance, this was the breakdown. <laughs> and then there was me. Actually, you know what? Holly was Jewish too. So we had me and Holly as the two Jews. And I know it sounds ridiculous to be counting Jews, but that's how I felt when my father would ask me ever so nonchalantly what people's last names were, what their mother's maiden names were, or what town in Poland their grandparents came from. No joke. It made me feel like I was hiding, actually, but not from my classmates, but from my father, lest he know that I was assimilated. I felt just like Anne Frank. No, I did not feel like Anne Frank, thank you. But the Holocaust is relevant, actually, because the reason for my father's panic was the, the concern, the anxiety, the terror that the Jews were dying out. And we needed to recreate what the Nazis had destroyed. I remember learning, for instance, at a very young age, too young of an age to be learning these things, that every single one of my sperm cells was precious because they had the capacity to replenish all the lives lost in the Holocaust. Seriously, I don't know what the exact mathematics were, if it was per ejaculation or per week or what. The point is, I knew that my sperm could do that. So you can imagine the pressure that's put on me. <laughs> Not to mention the ways I started thinking about sex. <laughs> and this adolescence, when I was discovering women, and when I say discovering women, I mean masturbating to Archie comics, because they had Betty and Veronica, who were these lovely two ladies uh, in the uh, atmosphere of Archie, but no one here knows that reference. So. Um, but anyway, it, it, all, it, it all comes back to comics with this, because I really believe that sex, death, and comics is the Jewish trinity. So on the one hand, Betty and Veronica, right here, were getting me off. And they, on, the, on the other hand, I was really aware of my responsibility to replenish the Jewish race, essentially. But sometimes I couldn't separate the two, and suddenly they just converged together. And this is a synthesis that was basically interesting me from puberty until today. The popular, the sacred, and the profane, and the personal mixed into the communal and the global. And what's the greatest story of good versus evil in the popular imagination, at least, that also, that also gets into very awkward father issues? I think you know. You know what that is, right, Israel? Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, it's Star Wars. I want to make a comic that inhabited the Jewish communal universe of good versus evil. After all, in the prism of American Jewish values, if Darth Vader is evil, then Darth Vader must have intermarried. <laughs> and Vader himself is half Jewish. And again, it wasn't in a vacuum. You might say, well, Darth Vader, isn't that an extreme example to compare you know, American Jewish community to? But it's not. This is a study written, to, written by the main uh, sociologist in the Jewish community of America today, warning of an inconvenient truth about the disaster wrought by in intermarriage. The study came out on the heels of the famous Al Gore film called An Inconvenient Truth. In other words, it talked about intermarriage through the lens of the destruction of the entire planet. So really, who's the satirist here? Me? Or the guy summoning dead birds and stranded polar bears? Honestly, I don't think there's any greater analogy to use than Star Wars for this kind of narrative. Without further ado, I would like to ask for people to volunteer for the roles of a lifetime. I have to be Vader once again. You? Was that you? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I'm sorry, Vader I'm half blind. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you don't have to do it again if you don't want to. But you, you do, right? <laughs> You're going to be Chewbacca, I know. So C-3PO, we got C-3PO here? Uh, C-3PO, thank you, thank you. Uh, Luke Skywalker, the star, the star. The star of the show. Luke? No, I don't want to force. Who? You want to be Luke? Okay, we got Luke. Princess Leia, the greatest Jewish princess of all time. <laughs> Who wants to be that? Yeah? Okay, cool. We are not gender exclusive, by the way. Beta Am is not gender exclusive. Uh, Yoda, we got a Yoda in the house? All right, good, thank you. And Han Solo? Han Solo? Do you want to trade? Are you good with... Okay. Who wants to be Han Solo? I'll do one. All right, thank you, thank you. All right then, uh, let's begin. I'll shoot the narration. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Master Luke, R2-D2 transmitted a coded message. R2-3, droid. It says a man named Darth Vader was born to his marrying parents. 
How is that a surprise? Millions of sales haters have married Gentiles, thus cutting off their ties to the Jewish people forever. That's just it, Master Luke. Darth Vader is building an empire for the intermarried, and their half breed children to flourish. But that's just suicide. I must stop him to save the Jewish people from catastrophe. Uh, R2D2 is saying, lift or twirl, which means beware the dilution of Jewish Jedi genetics. <laughs> Soon. Princess Leia, I'm off to battle Darth Vader, the evil half-Jew. That's great, but look, we have to stop seeing each other. I'm your sister. Better I sleep with my sister than with Jenta. <laughs> Luke travels to the great sage Yoda. So, Peter, Darth Vader is, exists without racial ethnocentricism, Judaism cannot. What should I do, Yoda? <laughs> Use the force. You must superior you must feel to all who Jewish mother have not. <laughs> Luke gathers allies in Han Solo and Chewbacca. We'll fight with starships, blasters, and policy papers insisting that intermarriage is the death star of Jewish civilization. Soon, Princess Leia stops the vile Jabba the Hutt from presiding over reform conversions. <laughs> That'll be the last time you you let Miss Mischlings. Mischlings into the Mechanism. And finally, at last I face you, Vader. I will not let you destroy the Jewish people. <laughs> what? It's not possible. You mean my identity must be based on something other than ethnocentric superiority? No! Good God, no! On to the dark side, Luke. No! Meanwhile, Han Solo and Chewbacca land on the forest moon of Endor. <laughs> okay, fine, but just remember, Ewoks are for practice. <laughs>
somehow the tape recording of my mom saying that got destroyed. <laughs> and and, it, and it, I've traveled with this tape. It's like precious to me. So I don't know if it's some kind of Mossad thing or what, but you know, it happened over the course, or over the Mediterranean Sea somehow. Anyway, let's, let's move on. Back to my family tree. This is my dad standing Dirty Harry style in front of his synagogue after it had been defaced by a swastika. This is my mom after feeding us peyote, teaching us kumbaya. <laughs> but my mom was not always like that. In fact, when they were married, they were both balei tshuva or chosrei uh, tshuva, you know? It's hard to translate that, but basically it means borderline psychotic. <laughs> I'm sorry if anyone here is a balei or you have relatives who are, but I actually think, I'm not insulting, I think it's a great sign of Jewish vitality and diversity that allows former moonies, drug addicts, and psychopaths into the fold. Anyway, um, <laughs> Here you can see my mom in the, in, when she was a Rebbitzin in the Sisterhood Brunch in the newspaper, in the lower left there. The difference is, though, my father stayed with it, whereas my mother, my mother left it, partly because she felt being a rabbi's wife was too constraining, and it was, really. Of course, the irony or paradox is that the obsession with continuity destroyed a marriage. But whatever, I don't pity myself. I don't actually take old <coughs> photographs and Photoshop them into magazines, because that would be creepy and perverse somehow. So let's just say that I'm well-adjusted. When my mom left, she left it all, and apparently became a government spy. And after the divorce, they went their separate ways. Here's my father organizing services on the Long Island Railroad. Seriously? And my mom became a social worker, working with underprivileged kids in Albany, New York. And um, that's actually where she met her boyfriend, because she was his caseworker in jail. It's a really sweet story. I like it. I tell people. Um, so in some ways I was caught between the two, with these very diverging backgrounds competing for my attention, and maybe for my soul. You can see my mom was really happy at this family reunion here. But ultimately, if I had to choose between going to services on the Long Island Railroad and hanging out with black kids in Albany, I'm going to prefer to hang out with black kids in Albany. And yet, and this is something that the ardent defenders of the faith often don't get about my comics, it's still my culture, and I'm still fascinated by it and fixated on it, and it's a great reservoir of artistic inspiration, and I refuse to let it be defined and controlled by the schmucks. <laughs> and I should add, uh, by the way, if you guys want to move <coughs> in, I'll be fine. Okay, <laughs> seriously. Uh, I should add that it's not just that my mom raised me, uh, that she stopped being religiously observant. She also raised me with a certain unique perspective. Uh, and you can see that in this letter she wrote me, uh, when I was, uh, I guess, 13 or 14 in summer camp, the same year that bar mitzvah photo was taken. So I guess I was 13. I want to read you part of it because it sort of will uh, establish her, her, uh, her guiding uh, philosophy on raising me. After, after telling me that she was going to have the camp uh, torture me and give me a Mr. T haircut, she signed off with this, which I think Beit Ha'am will, will appreciate. The 4th of July is approaching, a time when we must remember the struggles that our forefathers endured to establish on this continent a nation independent of the Queen and King of England, which land was to subsequently become a far greater threat to and violator of human rights, both here and abroad, than the parental England ever was. However, we must perform our patriotic role and light a sparkler. My son, I know you will carry on the family tradition and fart on the flag. <laughs> All my love, mommy. So, it should be no surprise that I identified so strongly with MAD when I first discovered it. I should mention, of course, my mom's older now, so these days, instead of telling me to fart on the flag, she tells me to Skype with her cat. But still, I, you know, there's a real revolutionary impulse, all the same. Anyway, if I'm fascinated by and fixated on the Jewish stuff, the question becomes, am I going to go my father's route and draw it as adorable kitten singing Hatikva, or my mother's route, and draw it as violent chimpanzees warring over tribal territory. And if it's the latter, and of course it is, it's a rhetorical question, is it really self-hatred, or is it actually Jewish cultural pride? The answer, B, Jewish cultural pride. You know, it's, I'm giving away the answer here, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk a little bit more about pride and authenticity, actually. Because a common misconception about my comics is that they're self-hating or uncaring. But obviously I care, Wait, by the way, I just want to say, um, yeah, I can see the power going on. All right, we're good. Okay, cool. Obviously, I care. I mean, if, if I didn't care, I wouldn't be spending so much time on each of these black and white lines obsessing with a brush to make it right. But there was a period when I cared too much. 
And when I say care too much, I mean develop the Messiah complex after visiting Jerusalem for two days. So, you know, we're doing my life story here, and now we're in the college years. Hope you're cool with that. Anyway, it was my first trip to Israel, and I was going through all the usual motions, you know, including sitting on a tank, <laughs> comparing myself to Herzl, and joining a cult, an Orthodox Jewish cult, actually. Baal Shuba, just like my parents. Apparently, dementia is genetic. It's a very warm story. Here you can see me with the, the long sideburns as proof of my psychotic devotion. But actually, you know, to be honest, all kidding aside, I was looking for authenticity or like the sense of a real Judaism that seemed to be missing from my childhood, whose Jewish essence seemed to be more focused on persecution and protest than joyful meaning. And I was really romantic about it. I, I, thought I'd, I thought that observant Judaism would explain my place in the world, including all the trauma of a broken home. I thought it would like give me sort of an explanation to everything that happened in my past. Um, seriously, I, 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 I even thought, like, I, I even found ways to explain the divorce in Kabbalistic terms, all while the, the culty men were doing their homoerotic dancing to welcome in the Sabbath. <laughs> So it comes full circle. I would be a Baal Shiva just like my parents had been. But I would do it better. I would write their wrongs, you know, the sins of the father, etc., etc. So I came back from Israel really thinking I had outdone my father in this Jewish business. Here we are on my return. I know it's the creepiest photo in the world. You know, what I found actually is that I hugged my father with the exact same posture I used to hug black girls on Halloween. You know, it's the exact pose. Anyway, I was convinced I'd found my path to authentic Judaism. But I was so desperate for meaning that I was in this romantic haze, and I wasn't hearing things correctly. So the rabbis of the yeshiva would be saying things like Arabs are dogs, you know, Aravim Klavim, is that it? Yeah, Aravim Klavim, you know? And not this kind either. They meant this kind, Kuja. And they'd be, say, they'd be saying that, but I'd be so wrapped up in the romance, you know? Instead of dogs, I'd be picturing goats playing violins, chickens at weddings and milkman bursting into song. So it is romantic, but it's also delusional. Eventually I snapped out of it, but it was only when Yitzhak Rabin was murdered that I had a serious break with orthodoxy. Because this, when, when he was murdered, it was an assault not only on politics, but on secular Judaism itself. For some reason, maybe it's the old Ashkenazi man thing, but Rabin always re reminded me of my mother's father. By the way, I'm going to talk about every single one of these family members here tonight, so we're going to give like 30 minutes to each. So you guys have time, I hope. Anyway, I know he didn't look physically like Rabin, identically, but in my mind, for whatever reason, they were fused. And my mom's father was this huge secularist. You know, according to family lore, every Pesach Seder, he would say, Avdinha, you know, but now we're free, basically. And so why are we eating flat bread? Why aren't we eating nice, nice bread? So then his wife would come out with a freshly a baked loaf of bread, and they'd all dig in. And that's actually my most cherished family anecdote involving religion. So that's why the orthodox murder of Yitzhak Rabin really cut close to the bone for me. It became personal, and I would never go back. But back to comics, right? We're having a good time. We're having a good time. I'm not going to get angry and depressed here, because that would be, that would be perverse. We're going to have a good time with The Odd Couple. This is actually a comic I did that got me in trouble, whatever that means, with the Haredi world, the ultra-Orthodox world in America, um, after a spokesman for them uh, claimed that this comic was one of the reasons for the Haiti earthquake, that this actually brought that about. There's a lot of logic in that world, I know. But the comic itself features Avi Klopnik, fundamentalist Jew, and Brian Greenstein, an American Jew who doesn't speak Hebrew, visiting Jerusalem for the first time. Whoa, I did that, yeah. Like all my comics, it's actually autobiographical. It's about me. I went a little premature there. But I try to take the no narcissism down a, lot, a notch by creating fake characters, but really, it's me. There I am. I know. It's, I should move quickly. Um, so, basically, I think this comic will be fun to do here in Israel because many of you, if not most, speak some Hebrew, right? And this one features a person who continues to misunderstand Hebrew. So. Um, are there any Hebrew speakers here who would like to take the role of Avi in Hebrew? Yes? Okay, cool. We have an Avi in Hebrew. Who would like to translate Avi? On the bottom of each panel, there will be translation. <laughs> it, it, yeah? Would you like? Yeah. Okay, cool. And, someone has to go on the okay. 
Brian Brian Greenstein? Who wants to be Brian? It could be a woman or a man. We're not gender exclusive. Mm, wait, someone else. You? Sorry, we just, you know, um, ecumenical, egalitarian, whatever. Okay, here we go. Thanks to an Orthodox Jewish outreach organization, Brian Greenstein spends his first Shabbat meal in Jerusalem with Avi Klotnik. Baruch Habat Lion? It's not Hebrew or, or Yiddish. It sounds like poetry. Vivid dream sounds from an exotic world. <laughs> oh, uh, um, wait. Okay, um, thank you so much, sir. Our, um, rabbi? Oh, God, do I say rabbi or just sir? I screwed up, I did, didn't I? He must think I'm a fool. Oh, and translate. Who is the translator again? Well, okay. Brian. Actually, the translation can go right after the Hebrew. So, okay, that's cool. No, no, we'll get the hang of it. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. And yes, yeah, it, it was kind of like the same word. In English. I understood that word. Shalom means peace. That must be the essence of Judaism: peace and love. <laughs> הבנים הרפורמים אינם שקרנים מטורפים, פושעים גויים שבעצמם הביאו את השואה לעם ישראל. רפורם רבי זה פילפי גוי ג'נטל קרנלס, הוא קרוב הולקרוסט של היהודים. אני מרגיש כל כך אשם, כשאני גדול בגלל שאני 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 It's so mesmerizing listening to him. Uh, though Abby lives and breathes authentic Judaism, I never felt like I could be part of it. The Prime Minister is a heretic who should be hung from the gallows. But listening to these sounds, so ancient and yet such a part of me, they're like beautiful melody that speaks to my soul. Devout prayer can change the chicken feathers from black to white. <laughs> Maybe this is like a second chance to finally live Judaism as it was meant to be lived, to belong to a people with a holy purpose. It is permissible to kill somebody who will one day become evil. Why not? I can start to live just like Avi. It would be a new life, a pure life. Like, like from the old country, with a beautiful bride and goats and fish and <laughs> violence everywhere. Homosexuality is like bird food, a plague that threatens to destroy Israel. I bet there's a fiddler playing on this very roof at this very instant. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I can't say help for you. Alain oh. Hashmid et ha mekomot hakrashim. של האיסלאם, להרוג גברים, נשים, טף ובקר, לחיים. We should destroy Muslim holy sites and kill their men, women and children and cattle. לחיים! I feel like Tevye the milkman, and Yentl, and Oscar Schindler, and that bubblehead Jewish doll I got for Christmas are all becoming, bearing witness to my epiphany. If I were a rich man, Papa, can you hear me? What's the person worth to you? Bobble. Epilogue. Two years later, Brian welcomes his own Shabbat guest. Shabbat Shalom. Jeff. 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 <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, Jeff. The Enlightenment was a poison on the Jewish soul. I feel so ashamed. Uh, yeah, I feel so ashamed. Growing up in Florida, my parents gave me no Jewish education, etc. Because the cycle continues. That's the end of that one. Um, <laughs> I do want to say, you know, I don't know if it's evidence to people here, but every single one of the quotations used by uh, Avi Klotnik was taken from actual ultra-Orthodox Haredi rabbis, including Chabad and others. And so this wasn't just, you know, um, ad hominem attacks, this was taking their own words and using them. So religious Judaism clearly didn't work for me. Uh, but the search continued for something authentic and for a means of connecting to the culture through self-expression, which leads to the next little diatribe. By the way, not to give spoilers here, but it's the comics themselves in the end, which is my means of connecting. But anyway, it was when I lived in Europe after college that I started re feeling a real cultural sense, uh, you know, Jewish cultural connection. There's a picture of me discovering my Jewish identity in Prague. <laughs> but really, there was a lot that was going on. I'm not going to get into it here. We don't have enough time now. But I will get into something that 
I'm interested in talking about, which is a statue. And I saw this on a, on a trip to Warsaw. It's Nathan Rappaport's famous Warsaw Ghetto Monument. The front of the monument was modeled on actual kibbutzniks, really. Um, and it was supposed to represent the fighting Jews of the ghetto and of the future. But when I saw the statue, I was wondering, you know, where are the Jews who died? Because the Warsaw Ghetto, sure, <coughs> there was, you know, a historic uprising, but mostly it was a <coughs> devastating tragedy. And you only see them when you walk around to the back of the statue, which is really like an afterthought. This looks much bigger here. It's much smaller, actually. And it's a base relief, a smaller uh, base relief of diaspora Jews huddled and hunched and heading to their slaughter. The statue has been in my mind for a while now. And I think it explains a lot about my aesthetics and my satire, and basically the two ingredients to in my comics. And I want to explain why. I love drawing these comics because they're dealing quite literally with the image of the Jew. And few other groups have been as concerned with their collective self-representation as modern Jews have been. But for most of Jewish history, the image of the Jew was, was uh, created and sustained by people who hated Jews. And eventually, many Jews internalized that uh, hatred and saw themselves through that light. I, I'm sure you've seen these kind of things before. I have a lot of them. We all have to have hobbies. So here's my anti-Semitic collection. But wait, I want to show you this one. I like this one. There's, actually, I don't mind being compared to those cute little bees, you know? I think they're, they're kind of adorable. But it's supposed to be a negative depiction, whatever. Point is, in the last century, a group of Jews decided it was time to seize Jewish destiny and finally remake the image of the Jew. And then, as the dog barks, we're going to start talking about Zionism here. So I just want to know, is it a safe space here to talk about Zionism and Beit Ha'am, or is Mossad going to cut my throat tonight? Because we're in Tel Aviv. Can we do it? Is it cool? Are we good? I don't want to upset anybody's sensitivities, you know? I see some people in the shadows over there. Seriously. Okay, so if, if I go anywhere that gets, you know, beyond the pale, you have to let me know. So, I am actually fascinated by Zionism because no other Jewish movement has been as focused and obsessed with the Jewish body. So far, so good. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you let me know in two minutes. And as an artist, somebody who draws faces and bodies, I love the focus on the form that Zionism represents. This is from a Zionist gymnastics journal from 1904. The idea was that Zionism would raise generations of strong, agrarian, revolutionary, mustachioed Jews. <laughs> the, the fun thing, actually, about Zionism is it takes itself rather seriously, which makes it all the more fun to satirize. And it's not limited to male imagery. In 1970, Playboy ran this spread on the girls of Israel. All of you, maybe your mothers, because it's from 1970. And it talks about superbly feminine beauty to grace this land of milk and honeys. And it says, the Israeli girl today is a totally new kind of woman, one still in the process of being created, almost without any ties to her past. As if that's a good thing. By the way, for what it's worth, I did not masturbate to any of these pictures. <laughs> and I say that because, you know, it's a matter of, you know, diaspora cultural pride, you know? If this was a pictorial on the Jewish girls of San Diego, I would have jerked off. <laughs> so for the early Zionist thinkers, a new Jew could not emerge without a serious repudiation of the contemporary Jew. This is a poster from 1948 for Betar, a right-wing Zionist group, with a text reading, the last generation of slaves, the first generation of free men showing the boundaries of a very, very, very greater Israel, including all of Jordan. Zionism is a very subtle movement, as you can see. And when people say that my comics should be more subtle, they have to understand that this is the kind of thing I'm drawing about. I'm drawing about Jews, and Jews are not a subtle people. But when they repudiated contemporary Jewish life, they actually, the early Zionists, reinforced a lot of anti-Semitic ideology. These images are from the turn of the, century, turn of the 20th century, uh, Art Nouveau Zionist artist Ephraim Moshe Lillian. Lillian had a thing for Herzl, the found, you know, Herzl, you know who Herzl is. He depicted him over here as an angel because he was like kind of obsessed. When I say he had a thing for Herzl, I'm not kidding. It's a penis, people, okay? Uh, phallic imagery. Um, but aside from Herzl, when he was drawing regular diaspora Jews, he depicted them as elderly, hunched over, crippled, and covered in barbed wire. Here he's striving towards Zion. Here the pyramids of Egypt are symbolic of exile. These images of diaspora Jews were not exactly positive, but I wouldn't call them uh, hateful or anti-Semitic either. For that, you need to actually read the writings of early Zionist thinkers. And that's where it got, frankly, putrid. I'm going to read this one. 
The emancipated Jew is insecure in his relations with his fellow man, timid with strangers, and suspicious even of the secret feelings of his friends. He has become a cripple within, and a counterfeit person without, so that like everything unreal, he is ridiculous and hateful to all men of high standards. That wasn't from Mein Kampf. That was from Max Nordau, one of the founders of Zionism. <coughs> this Nazi image of Aryan versus Jew could have been used with very little alteration in an early Zionist pamphlet about the new Jew versus the previous crippled Jew. And to this day, Zionism needs its foil. And I would argue that the foil is not the Palestinian. The foil is the Jew. I know this work gets preachy. Uh, I'm sorry. I am my father's son, and so, you know, of course it's gonna, I was going to inherit some of those tendencies. Besides, all those books when I was little had an effect on me. But don't worry, there will be just a little more of this, then you can go home and watch Big Brother. I understand Big Brother is a big hit right now, so I, that's, the, I, that's my making things topical for you people. Uh, anyway, the Holocaust only reinforced this view of new Jew versus old Jew. Here again at the back of the Rapport Memorial. You know, it's um, deliberately referencing the destruction of Jerusalem in the Arch of Titus, which showed a hero versus victim view of Jewish history, which to me is frankly more suitable to comic books than to a national liberation movement. Clearly we have a Zionist dog right here. Uh, this mad super duper man, uh, which you know, to me kind of like reminds me of uh, Zionist ideology. I find this stuff to be not only offensive, but ridiculous, essentially, because it's an oversimplification of Jewish history, and because it refuses to acknowledge what to me is pretty clear, that some of the greatest Jewish achievements and accomplishments occurred in the diaspora. And you could even argue they occurred because of the diaspora. Now, I know Israel invented the cell phone, and I keep hearing that my entire life. And, you know, I love the cell phones. It's great. But come on, you know. Um, so I deal with this ridiculousness the best way I know how, which is drawing comics. Some people have said that this is an anti-Semitic image. Actually, no, it's a Zionist image. <laughs> so this is a comic I did called Israel Man and Diaspora Boy. What I basically did was I just drew the stuff that I learned in Hebrew day school, summer camp, trips to Israel, and experiences with emissaries. True story, you might find this interesting. For the first 15 years of my life, I was convinced that the word shaliach was Hebrew for douchebag. <laughs> because all of my encounters with these people were basically telling me that my culture is shit, that I, that I have nothing outside of Israel, and that only if I move and make aliyah will I be a full human being. What's interesting about this comic, aside from the fact, are there any Zionist uh, ideologues in here? Because maybe I should uh, find out about that first. Um, no Zionist understands this comic. I know some, I'm, I'm friends with some Zionists. And honestly, it's not like I'm an anti-Zionist. Um, but I do know some, some Zionists, and they're always like, <laughs> But, because I get accused of arguing ideological divides that disappeared in the 1950s. And that it's all over now, you know? Because we're all one people, right? Peoplehood. Kalal Yisrael, right? You've heard this, right? So my comics are a thing from the past. They're as vestigial as the things I'm making fun of. Yeah, right. The same critics have read these articles. Don't legitimize diaspora, Israel's new president warns. That was, I think, one or two years before he was put on trial for serial rape. It's a subtle move. It's very subtle. Sorry. This is diaspora boy coming out of the throat here. Israeli writer, Jews in France are partial Jews. This is interesting, actually, because they used to say that diaspora uh, Jews would physically die. But now that one could argue that we're safer outside of Israel than inside Israel, they say they will die spiritually or demographically, meaning our numbers will, will dwindle into nothing. Or that we're incomplete outside Israel. Or that diaspora teens need to visit Israel in order to build Jewish pride or to have erect penises. Which is impossible to attain in, say, Michigan. No future for diaspora Jewry, says Netanyahu. Oh gosh, thanks. Here's another four billion dollars. <coughs> Now, I want to note, my Israeli friends, Tavirim, that your country today is thankfully not living out this preposterous ideology. You, you've actually normalized to a certain degree. Um, and you're not like living your founding myths. But Zionist intellectuals, and I'm using that term loosely because they're idiots, are still stuck in it. They're still stuck in the 1950s, both in Israel and abroad. And you'll find this uh, if you just take a trip to the Diaspora Museum right here in Tel Aviv. Because the, Di the Diaspora Museum here in Tel Aviv, what's the Hebrew term for it? <coughs> there you go. Is Israel's national edifice dedicated to chronicling the way that I live because I live outside of Israel. I understand they're currently in talks to change it because they suddenly realize that maybe having 
uh, hateful museum in 2011, 2012, maybe not a good idea, but it's been like that for decades now. And I love the Diaspora Museum, actually, because it's the saddest museum in the world. <laughs> Look at these poor, miserable synagogue goers, these colorless corpses at prayer. True story, the Nazis in Prague during the Holocaust had intended to create a museum of an extinct race. The Israelis succeeded. There are over 100 figurines in the exhibits here. Not a single one is smiling. I know the term Kafka gets overused, but this is Diaspora as a hallucinatory nightmare prison theme park. That's not supposed to be a concentration camp. That's supposed to be a Jewish market square. Not, not joking. Oh, hi, Franz. <laughs> if only Israel existed, our lives would have sunlight and color. Oh, I love this. Jews of world renown exhibit. Empty. <laughs> it was an electrical malfunction, but still, I'm a polemicist. I will use it. I will use it. My favorite, actually, is the wedding display. Sweetheart, you're getting married today, but you live in the diaspora, so put on your miserable face. Even the, even the violinist here is crying. Now here's the thing, if you take a trip from Tel Aviv, uh, which is where we are right now, to Jerusalem, I think you know how to do it, using a shade or something, and you go to Yad Vashem, outside Yad Vashem you'll see the uh, Nathan Rapport Memorial bifurcated, so it's not in the back, but it's you know, split out, and also the back is much, much larger, because here uh, at Yad Vashem, they're focusing on the destruction. And inside, this is what you'll find. You'll find a model of Auschwitz. From the changing area to the gas chambers to the crematoria. Using the same style, the same colorless, lifeless bodies that we see in the Diaspora Museum. And it's understandable in Yad Vashem because they're deliberately mimicking the Nazi campaign of dehumanization. But it's not understandable in the Diaspora Museum unless you understand Zionism. When people talk about self-hatred, this is government-sponsored self-hatred created to sustain a national ideology. All I do is illustrate the ideology taken to the extreme. And honestly, I don't need much help in that. This is why Zionist intellectuals do not understand my comics. This is an ad that ran a couple years ago on Israeli television. Maybe you're familiar with it urging Israelis to save their brethren in the diaspora from being lost through intermarriage. You can see the train tracks subtly uh, recalling Auschwitz. You know, Zionism, again, it's a, it's a movement of subtlety. I want to make this clear, you know, so I don't get excommunicated or masaded tonight. I am not an anti-Zionist. I'm just not a schmuck. <laughs> and of course, with this attitude, it's inevitable that you end up eating your own. I don't know if you heard the news uh, recently in the past couple months. There's a series of more recent ads that ran uh, in America, urging Israelis uh, yeah, to move back to Israel because uh, if they marry Americans, Jewish or otherwise, they will soon forget what Yom HaZikaron is. And their kids will celebrate Christmas, much to the chagrin and dismay of their parents Skyping from Israel. Just a single generation, it'll all be over because that's what diaspora does to identity. People ask why I draw comics. Bullshit like that is why I draw comics. So without further ado, I would like to, actually I think this would be really nice, to do Israel Man Diaspora Boy right here in the heart, the belly of the beast, if you will. You know, the heart of the mythology as it is today. Um, and so, do we have anyone here who would like to play the part of your national hero, Israel Man? Haha, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, when push comes to shove, you won't, you won't step up. Any of the uh, Masai agents? <laughs> Yes? Okay. okay, cool. We have, a, we have an Israel man. Would anyone like to play the sniveling, disgusting, decrepit diaspora Jew? <laughs> diaspora boy. Yeah? All right, that one right. You want it? You look, you know, you, you don't want to? <laughs> I don't want to force you. Sorry? No, you won't. You won't. Are you sure? Okay. This is, okay, here we go. This, I really feel like it's almost a spiritual moment here because we're doing it in the heart of Israel, you know? Okay. I'm so depressed, Israel man. Why, they ask for a boy? Aside from the fact that you're a crippled half man, whose very existence is an end that's one to the humanity. That's just it. In all the lands I've been to, all the areas of art, music, film, literature, philosophy, religion, and ethics, I have not accomplished anything. 
not to rub it, not to rub it in, you disgusting tree slug. <laughs> but every year I create timeless classics in each of those areas. Why am I such a complete and utter failure, Israel man? You're a genetic aberration, a handicapped version of me. <laughs> it's inevitable, even necessary, that you disappear from this world. This is why Israel's leading novelist, novelist says diaspora is neurotic, immoral, and schizophrenic. You're nothing more than masturbation compared to the real thing embodied by me. <laughs> it's so true. Intellectually, culturally, and yes, physically, I am simply spilling my seed. Whereas I am impregnating the world. <laughs> <laughs> You are the summation of everything I could ever hope for, Israel man. Well <laughs> <laughs> put, you weak, cowering, winter mensch. It's why you, you, it's why yesterday we focused on your pogroms and servility, and today on your intermarriage and self-hatred. It's why we say one becomes a total human only by ascending to my state. It's why our Holocaust commemorating distinguished distinguish heroes from victims. It's why we have museums, monuments, and folklore about how you are a disgusting peria on the verge of extinction. I am pure shit. <laughs> Allow me to quote from early Zionist philosopher Jacob Glatsky. A diaspora can only sustain the existence of a people disfigured in both body and soul in a world of a horror. At the very most, it can maintain us in a state of national impurity and breed some sort of outlandish creature. A creature such as you, diaspora boy. Come to think of it, with friends like this, who needs the anti semites What about that? Nothing, dear. No, nothing. Bow down to your, I bow down to your infinite wisdom and providence, Israel man. Can I get you anything? A cup of tea? Another four billion? Naturally, you extinction bound mouth. Just thinking about this semitism makes me cringe. It is my lot of life. Every day in fear of the gas chambers. <laughs> that's why I, that's why I was created, your revolting relic of a wretched race. To put an end once and for all to anti-Semitism. How? How do you propose to do that? That's what I'm typical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Watch as I poke the <laughs> <laughs> Muslim with a stick. <laughs> are, are you sure this is a good idea? Of course, you're trembling, get up mentally, help with. This will end anti-Semitism forever! <laughs> Forgive me, sir, I should never pretend to advise you. Your decisions will surely rebound to my benefit. Good boy, stupid diaspora cur. After all, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> the end. Woo! Okay, moving on. Just a little bit more, don't worry. This is actually a drawing of how I picture the commenters in my comments. Because now that we've talked about Jewish self-image, I want to say a couple things about Jewish self-hatred. For these comments, I've been called a Nazi, a self-hater, a traitor, and a ghetto Jew. The last one, actually, ghetto Jew, is interesting to me. Because what's a ghetto Jew? Isn't a ghetto Jew somebody who's terrified of speaking openly about community issues? And doesn't a ghetto Jew define himself based on the thoughts of anti-Semites. I think you can make a com uh, an argument that the commenters, the critics, are more reflective of a ghetto mentality than the comics themselves are, but obviously I'm biased in that regard. But it's weird, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, it was normal for Yiddish satirical cartoonists in New York City, and elsewhere actually, in Warsaw especially, to eviscerate community leaders. This is a cartoon by Leon Israel from 1911, comparing Jewish sweatshop owners to Pharaoh. That was just a sign of vibrant Jewish culture back then. And I think it's a paradox that now that the American Jewish community has become arguably, or inarguably, the most powerful <coughs> Jewish community in world history, it's become less and less confident about internal debate. But I want to talk about self-hatred. I know, this is Larry David, by the way, you know? Okay. 
Um, I know it's fashionable for people to say that they hate themselves, but when people accuse others of, of self-hatred, I think it's pretty presumptuous. Because what is the self that they're talking about? And how do they know what my self is, for instance? When Kurtzman and Elder, the great you know, creators of MAD, created Mickey Rodents, were they self-hating? Well, of course not. They'd only be self-hating if their self was um, a cartoon mouse or a sleazy, labor-busting, red-baiting, anti-Semitic mogul, which is what Walt Disney was, which they clearly were not, Baruch Hashem. So to say someone's self-hating, you have to presume to know what their innermost self is. So am I self-hating? If I am, when I am satirizing Orthodox Judaism, this must be my true self that I despise. But that's not me, that's not my essence, Baruch Hashem. Or when I'm satirizing Zionist dogma, this must be my true self that I despise. But Baruch Hashem, that's not me either. Or when I'm satirizing the idea that Jewish identity should be determined by the thoughts of anti-Semites, this must be my true self, Abe Foxman, the ADL leader in America. But that's not me. Baruch Hashem again for that. This is me. And I, I don't hate that kid. I might, to be honest, have a little problem with those slippers, but I don't hate myself. I'm pretty comfortable with, with who I am and where I came from, relatively speaking, of course. I might hate these schmucks, I admit that, but I don't hate myself. And I was thinking about this tendency to define others and then conclude that they hate themselves based on what just a second ago you defined them as. And I was thinking, why don't I try that? <coughs> so those who insist that Jewish culture should be anemic, sterile, and devoid of thought, or that critical commentary means that someone is a Nazi, a traitor, a ghetto Jew, or a self-hater, they're just turtles paralyzed in their cages. And they hate themselves because they're paralyzed turtles. That's their amphibian essence. <laughs> and so this last comic I would like to dedicate to all the turtles out there typing away in their, in their little cages with Wi-Fi access, I guess, in their, in their cages so that they can call Jews Nazis all over the internet. This one is for them. And so without further ado, we'd like to, I would like to end this little uh, production, if you will, with Stuart the Jewish Turtle. Do I have any volunteers to play the man? There's only three characters, a man, a woman, and a turtle. Man. Got a woman here? Turtle. The turtle is the the character. Stewart. You beat you beat Stewart. Excellent. Thank you. Are we out of milk? I thought we got milk on Tuesday. Palestinians have never missed an opportunity <laughs> to miss an opportunity. <laughs> 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 Couldn't have finished an entire gallon since Tuesday. Maybe we didn't get milk then. Current rates of zero population growth. The American Jewish community could number no more than ten thousand by the year two seventy five. I'll stop off your milk on the way back later. It's too bad I hate dry cereal. Only a self-hating Jew would read the New York Times, an anti-Semitic rag that refers to terrorists as militants. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go out then. You can pick up some coffee too. Okay, I love that new hazelnut thing. Who needs Nazis when an entire generation is intermarrying at rates that would make our forefathers tear their loaves in shape? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit sweet, but I like it too. Do we need anything else besides help? We learned on 9-11 that Israel's wars are America's wars. Any attempt to deny this is to surrender to an Islamo-fascist caliphate. Here's the list. We should add dish detergent too, right? Oh yeah, we're out of that. Barack Hussein Obama's first act as president will be to, to restart the transports to Treblinka. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Stuart. We'll be back soon. We love you, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the end of our little production.
the, the way you refer to the different parties is very binary. Even the word, like, yeah. you hate this guy, but you love this guy, you hate this guy, you love this guy. And to some extent, you know, you say, well, it's comics, what do you expect? You don't expect subtlety in comics. Right. But, uh, but, but then you think, I mean, you're, this, this is obviously for adults, and, and maybe you want to enrich the discourse with something more subtle than just, you know, the Israel man who's like that, and the, like the going to those extremes, isn't there like an alternative of something more evolved and subtle? Uh, um, to criticize others for not being subtle. Right. Your work is obviously not very subtle as well. Right. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, I don't think you can make the case that I, I refuse to acknowledge you know, uh, that comics are, um, by their very nature, unsubtle. They can be subtle. Satire, though, the kind of satire I like, is not subtle. And that's, that's just basically the tradition that I'm working in. Um, I do think you have to understand that um, the kind of satire I'm doing is reacting to extremist ideology, okay? In these, in these particular comics, I am lampooning the extremism where we have come as a people today. And so, yes, I could do another comic that's like 20 pages long that, you know, investigates the various elements that are happening here, but you know, or, you know, the, the historical trends, etc. But it's really not my interest. When I see some of the crazy shit that passes for news today, I have a visceral reaction. And the aesthetics that I like, and the, the satire that I like, involves black and white lampooning of these issues. So I, I recognize that it's not for everybody, but um, I, I think there is a place for this. I think it sort of gives people a release when they are feeling pressured from the insanity of the headlines. That didn't answer your question, did I? Because you're clearly not uh, satisfied. No, no. I think you could also make a case, since you know you asked further, um, <laughs> that uh, by their very nature, by adding to the, the the dialogue in this way, when there really hasn't been a, a place for this kind of pugilistic, like punching back, they are they are sort of a call for greater subtlety. Maybe I don't. Know. I need some more coffee. Yes. Do you think that comics, uh, much like the Jewish are outmoded and destined to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> uh, first of all, yeah. No, no. I don't think the Jewish people are disappearing. I don't think comics are disappearing. So, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a ridiculous. I didn't study ph philosophy. Oh, it's a joke. I'm sorry. You got me all pissed off now. I'm going to draw a comic. <laughs> sorry? He was, he was that was irony. Yeah, oh, I forgot. I don't know what irony is. Okay. No, that, that was good. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's dark in here. I can't see your face. I can't. I can't see the arch of the eyebrow. <laughs> yes, sir. Are these like uh, self-published, or do is a web comic? Or like oh no, they're in the forward newspaper. Sorry, I should have made that clear. These are uh, on the artist page of the forward newspaper, which is a uh, Jewish paper in New York City. Which is a liberal. Yeah, it has a, it has a great uh, progressive tradition. It continues to be um, somewhat progressive to this day. Um, and uh, it used to be a Yiddish paper back in the day, and now it's an uh, English language. Yiddish is, uh, there is uh, a Jewish version. language. I'm it sorry? Comes out in English. Pardon me? It comes yeah, out yeah, in English yeah. I believe Russian too. Yeah, yeah. Do you get a lot of hate mail? Um, I don't get like personal mail so much, but I get the comments on the comics, not on my website, but if you click through to the forward or to the original place of publication. A lot of anger as, as I sort of encapsulate it with the Stuart stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask first? Yes, <laughs> the media is always unbiased. <laughs> a lot of uh, artists, uh, comics artists, want to please if you can uh, close this because we can't see his face. Thanks. It's crucial. Yes. Now we can see. So, so a lot of uh, artists, comics uh, want to influence something. What is the main thing that you want to influence? That's a tough question because there's a, there's a lot that I want to influence, but um. I guess ultimately I, I would like the, um, the, the, the space in which you can be Jewish today to be wider, you know? Because all my comments are basically sort of um, reactions against this increasingly um, constrained space, whether it's within Israel, within Zionism, within Jewish life, in which um, you know, their, their exclusion seems to be um, more the norm than the exception these days. And, uh, Aside from that, I would also say that within the American Jewish community, there was a lot of 
sort of, um, there, there's a huge divide between the actual Jews, most American Jews are liberal, progressive, and active in progressive causes, and the minority of Jews who happen to be either giving more money or have positions of power in the American Jewish community. It's not democratic. It's purely based on nepotism or you know who's giving money. And those people, I'm making a generalization now, but it's borne out by the policies that, that the communal institutions uh, reflect, especially regarding Israel, are much more conservative. And I would like that divide to end. And I would like uh, American Jews who are overwhelmingly progressive to have their views reflected in our, in our institutions to a greater degree than they are today. Are you happy with J Street? You know, I have to say I'm not unhappy with them. I, I know that there are some complaints, but um, based on, on what they're up against, I think they're doing a pretty good job. So I am, I am you know, pretty happy with them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's great to finally have an alternative pay pack, you know? I know there are people who attack them from the left and from the right, but I mean, attacking them from the right, whatever. Um, those who attack them from the left, you know, they're being idealists and purely, purely, you know, much more idealistic than me. I think J Street is doing a pretty good job at the moment. Uh, for those who don't know, apparently, because J Street apparently is not known everywhere in Israel, from what someone told me yesterday, actually. So J Street is the, <coughs> sorry, relatively new, um, pro-Israel, but not pro-fascism lobby in America. Yeah. So basically, they favor two-state solution. Okay, mingling time. We got another question? Or are we good? All right. Toda vez, toda vez.